And in the midst of this, I pop out of my body and all of a sudden I find myself suspended above my body and Ron's. And I, I'm shocked. I have this view from above. And then I look to my right and there's Ron. And Ron's face, that's what I see is his big face. I don't see much of a body, but a huge face. He is smiling as, and he's communicating with me telepathically as if to say, you know, look where I am, check this out and welcome. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for joining me wherever you are in the world right now. I am Louisa, your host, and I can't wait to talk to our guest today, William Peters. William Peters experienced an extraordinary shared death experience. William is recognized as a global leader in the field of shared death studies. He's spent decades studying end of life experiences, a practicing grief and bereavement therapist. Peter holds degrees from Harvard Graduate School of Education and UC Berkeley. William Peters is the founder of the Shared Crossing Project and director of its research initiative. He's the author of At Heaven's Door, exploring the many ways the living can and do accompany the dying on their journey into the afterlife. This is his story and this is his passion. William, welcome to Passion Harvest. I'm so excited and honored to have you on the show today. Thank you, Louisa. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. You've done so much incredible work. I just wanted to start with, for the audience that may not know, what is a shared death experience? Yes. So uh, a shared death experience occurs when someone is dying and a caregiver or loved one, and sometimes even a bystander, reports that they shared in this transition from this life to whatever lies beyond. Uh, and they often use the term uh, afterlife. And, and in this way, I feel like I went into the initial stages of the afterlife with my loved one. Well, moving on, that's a great segue, because in 2000, I know you had an incredible shared death experience. Would you mind if you feel comfortable sharing it with the audience? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so I was working at Zen Hospice project in San Francisco. I was actually a volunteer. I was uh, training as a psychotherapist at that time, but I was really interested in end of life, in what happens uh, at the time of death and, and, bef and before and slightly after the whole experience of transition. And I'll talk a little bit later about why I was really interested in that. But at this point in time, I was just uh, had this privilege of being on a 24 bed uh, hospice ward. And I say that because it was, it was a wonderful opportunity to be with many people who were transitioning. Uh, it was a public hospital. So many times people would come in uh, indigent, uh, not having resources, not having family, a lot of homeless people, uh, what have you. And that actually was a beautiful opportunity for all of us uh, who worked and volunteered there because they were alone and looking for support. So we were actually able to uh, develop relationships in the short time that they were there. So it was a beautiful experience. And on one afternoon, I was reading a story to an individual, we'll call him Ron. And Ron had been a merchant marine in his life. That means he had ventured all over the world. He was, you know, definitely, um, just a big spirit. And I, and I got to meet him before he started his decline. So as Ron was declining, uh, he became uh, unresponsive. That means he just was not able to communicate anymore. And so I would read to him because he always had loved adventure stories. I was reading him on this afternoon, uh, Jack London's Call of the Wild. And so he is just there making no moves whatsoever, eyes gently closed. And I'm reading the story. And in the midst of this, I pop out of my body. And all of a sudden I find myself suspended above my body and Ron's. And I'm, I'm shocked. I have this view from above. 
And then I look to my right and there's Ron and Ron's face. That's what I see is his big face. I don't see much of a body, but a huge face. He is smiling. I see his teeth. He's, he's just uh, a billion and, and glowing. As, and he's communicating with me telepathically as if to say, you know, look where I am, check this out and welcome. And, and so I am stunned, but I'm also somewhat, I should say, um, comforted because this is a space that is very inviting, that I'm sharing it with Ron. I see Ron's happy and not suffering. And sometime later, I don't even know how much time later, but I don't think I stopped reading. So that's a whole thing about the time space continuum mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. I'm back in my body. And like I said, I don't even think I stopped reading. It's just kind of like a parallel uh, experience, parallel dimension, if you will. But that experience was profound because it let me know that Ron and the, all these people I was helping transition were in a certain way tri titrating back and forth. Not all of them, of course. This was a, you know, when you're on hospice, you're doing a slower type of death. There are different types of death. A sudden death is completely different. But in this environment where people are dying slowly, um, it, it suggests that there's this going back and forth. And Ron, it seems, was sharing with me where he was. It was as if he invited me to join him. And this is my, you know, I, I have a couple other experiences, but this is my real first full-on shared death experience where he invited me into the space where he was. And very soon after this, he was transitioning. Uh, and I should say, you know, when we talk about the shared death experience, one of the, the probably the dominant motif is that of journey. In other words, when we share in or get access to the dying's experience, what we're being shown or what's being revealed is the journey they are on, the journey they are beginning. And in some cases we see them we can share with this all the way up until they enter into a light. Uh, so, so yeah, there, that was my first experience. Well, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. First of all, I have to take my hat off to you working in hospice. Um, I don't know if I could do it. Uh, many people, and, and, and I was just thinking many people, why are we so afraid of death in our culture? Many people are afraid to do that. You know, I, I, that is a, uh, a problem with, with modern people, for sure. The more civilized we are in a certain way, if you want to use that term, it seems to be the more that we want to push death to the margins. Everyone can acknowledge that we're going to die. Our friends, our family, our loved ones are going to die. But we have a way of putting it off in the distance and making it somehow not relevant to our life right now. And this lack of relationship with death has created uh, a, a whole series of, of challenges. And, and the number one challenge, I think, is because we don't know death, because we're not in relationship with death, we fear it. And the images we get of it and what we, how we conjure up uh, death is presented largely in the media and, and sadly in some, for most of us, some not very good deaths we might have been a part of. And when I say not very good deaths, what I mean is because of lack of preparation, when we get into a terminal death or a, uh, a, a death situation where death is, you know, whether it's an accident, a heart attack, a stroke, or what have you, death becomes, death lands in us as an emergency. And when death is an emergency, an emergent situation or an emergency situation, we tend to give that experience of death to the medical establishment. Mm -hmm. And the medical establishment really has uh, one dominant uh, mode of dealing with death, and that is to resist it and to prolong life. And that's a beautiful service they provide for us. I mean, if you, you know, the modern medical system is incredible. If you have a, a trauma and you end up in one of our emergency departments, 
they are extraordinary at, uh, at finding ways to keep us alive. However, death is going to happen to all of us. No one gets out of here alive. <laughs> yeah, and we are, <laughs> we are utterly unprepared for them. So what I'm bringing to our attention is the fear of death often comes up because we get in situations where we're not prepared, even if we've done our advanced care directives, which is essential, and we know how we want to be with our loved ones, even if we've expressed it to our loved ones, we often don't get the end of life experience that we think we're going to get, are we prepared for? And because of that, we tend to give our dying uh, to the medical establishment, and they can really only do, you know, a few things. And it's typically very excessive, their means are extreme. And, and we, we, we watch our loved ones go through a great deal of aggressive medical treatment. And, and, and okay, that's okay for some situations. But when you watch that happen to your loved ones, and you see how it impacts them, it's scary. Yeah, it's scary. The fear makes sense. So I'm saying a lot here, but I think it's very important. What we want to do as a culture is really welcome death in and know that it's going to happen, have conversations with our loved ones, be very clear about what we're willing to do and not do, and be willing to manage our deaths as, as you know, ourselves, if we have enough consciousness to do that, with our loved ones, with families, what, what have you. We have to advocate for ourselves. And I think when people realize the options that are truly available at the end of life, you know, I work a lot with person, you know, people who have terminal illnesses and they start out with a cancer diagnosis saying, I'm going to fight this. And some, most of the people I work with, and this can be over, you know, months or years, they get to a point where they just say, I want to, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to fight. I want to go live my final chapter of my life with grace and dignity. And I want to do it at home, surrounded by my loved ones. And I don't care if I have, you know, a few months or years left. I want to do it on my terms. I want to be as comfortable as I can be. And I want to finish all the things, all my relationships, expressing what I want to express and expressing the love primarily for the people in my life. And I don't want to be in a medical environment fighting hopelessly for a few more months uh, with a low quality of life. So all of this is to answer your question directly. Here's why we have the fear. We don't know enough about it, about death. We push it to the margins as if it's a you know, uh, an experience that we just don't want to have anything to do with. And then when, because of that, when we get in a death situation, it's often uh, a, an emergency situation that is over medicalized and looks scary. So we need to bring death back into our living room, basically. And, and prepare a little bit more. I guess I have to ask you the universal question. In your opinion, what happens when we die? You know, I have my own personal experiences and then I have my experience based on the, the research that my team has done for the you know, better part of the last decade. Uh, I'll, my, I'll start with my personal experience. Um, I had a near death experience when I was 17 years old and it was a high speed skiing accident and I crushed my spine and I was catapulted out of my body and sailed away from my body, this earth. I saw all of it. I was looking back at a beautiful earth and into a beautiful galaxy, I saw my life reviewed before me, all that I had done in those previous 17 years. It was a real a karmic teaching, by the way, a sense of every action mattered. It rippled into uh, the relationships of my life. And then I ran into that light and uh, the beautiful, loving, awesome light. And I pled with this light to go back to this life. Uh, most near-death experiencers, this is the experience I was having, a near-death experience, most of us will not plead to go back because it's so loving and sublime in that dimension. Uh, I uh, pled to come back, and I did come back. But what I learned from that experience is that what lies beyond here, best I can tell, 
is that there's a loving existence and that I go on and whatever I want to call myself continues behind this human life. I had another near-death experience that was uh, very different, but it, I was in an ICU with a blood imbalance and hovered above my body for probably four to six hours. And I was watching all the behaviors uh, in the ICU, nurses talking, doctors doing their rounds, janitors cleaning up. And I was very much at peace. At one point, the doctor came and tapped on me and said, Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters, I, I would like to talk to you. I, I, can you wake up? And I was above this doctor and my body looking down at myself saying, oh my gosh, that's me down there. And I have a choice whether to go back into that body or not. So from these experiences, I realized that whatever I call myself is not dependent on my physical body. So my personal view is that when we die, we let go of this body and this essence of ourselves, call it soul, call it spirit, consciousness and individual consciousness goes on to some other realm. And everything I can tell about it is that it's a, it's a benevolent realm. Now in our research uh, with now, you know, 225 plus deep interviews with shared death experiencers, almost all of them will express that they know they'll, they go on. Well, what they say is I saw my loved one. I experienced my loved one go on to another dimension and is, a, and is, and these are their words. We see this is alive and well in a better place an afterlife or what have you. That's better than here. Uh, and I think that's true too. There's something about this realm, this human realm that has a good deal of uh, challenge and pain and suffering, what have you. It's a beautiful realm for a lot of things, primarily learning. Uh, but the realm that lies beyond here from what we can tell and what our uh, experiencers tell us is that it's a much more benevolent realm. So uh, the other piece we hear in the research is they feel like they will join their loved ones, reunite at some other point, which is very comforting for them. And their fear of death uh, is almost uh, alleviated completely. They no longer fear death. So this is, so, so when, I, to answer your question, what do I think happens when we die? I think the research supports my own personal experience. Of course, I've had a number of these experiences myself. So I, I'm just separating out. I, I'm pretty clear that the initial stages of where we go after, during death, the transition is easy. We get a lot of comfort. I should say that one of the features we see in the shared death experience is that we are supported, that there, there are these deceased relatives that come to meet us or elevated beings that, that come and greet us, that help us along this, this journey. And some of us need help. Leaving the earth realm can be quite disoriented, but there seems to be a good deal of support. So I think death is a, a, a relatively... Uh, easy, well-supported process. There is uh, an entity. I want to just mention this uh, because I think it's so profound. It is actually the most interesting part of the shared death experience because I'm always asking with all the intricacy of the transition. And I mean, it is an intricate process from what I can tell all the different phenomena that people can experience as they transition. And yet why this phenomena and that that phenomena and why this person shows up or why that elevated being and why sometimes no one there to greet you? What is this all about? Is there some sort of force behind this all? And in my research, I, I have identified a force that I call the conductor. And sometimes this conductor, uh, well, the role of the conductor in my yeah, and from my research and my impression is that this conductor facilitates the movement of the soul spirit consciousness of that human being that was residing in that human being into this next dimension. That is the role of the conductor. And it appears in a lot of our cases. And, it, and they'll say this beautiful being emerged and it was 
you know, there's, you, you know, you can, there's just various manifestations of this conductor. Sometimes it appears as angelic, a big bean of light. And even we have one case where it's moving its wings in a certain way. Uh, that's what it was described as by this experiencer and coaxing the spirit out of the human body. And then, then this person, this experiencer saw the spirit of, in this case, it was uh, her father-in-law come out of the crown of this person and gently rise up and go into this light and always guided by this being of light that look, had an angelic presentation. And so it seems as if this is one manifestation of the conductor. There are many forms. Uh, and, and it seems like this force is uh, facilitating the transition in a very sophisticated way. There's timing seems to be important because uh, some of the experiencers will say that here I was, I could see my deceased relatives around but I, I didn't see the spirit of my loved one yet. I didn't see anything there. And then I, I'm wondering what's going on. And, and, and what we're getting is they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. And the conductor is there, sometimes seen, sometimes not seen, oftentimes not seen. And yet there's a deference on the other beings that are there to the conductor, knowing that the conductor, this force, is managing this whole intricate process of transition to another dimension. So I wanted to mention that because I think that's a huge part that our research is uncovering uh, and it's highly relational. I, that's one thing I've just been so moved by is that it is highly, highly relational and, and in a good way. It's that there's this caring beings that are here to help us with this great uh, movement out of the human existence into what lies beyond. Well, amazing. And thank you so much for sharing your own personal experiences as well. So many people are grieving for lost ones and you're a grief and bereavement therapist or specialist. What would you say to the ones that are left behind that are missing loved ones or grief? It's a whole process in itself. My gosh, what would you have? What's your advice? You know, it's often said that grief is the price we pay for loving deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's true. Uh, you know, when you lose someone you love and they've been a, you know, an integral part of your life in any way, uh, the loss is going to be painful. I, I don't think we should be looking um, to a good death or good grief and bereavement processes as absence of pain and, and deep heartache. I think that's part of it. But what I tell people is to allow yourself to be fully in these experiences and to allow yourself to feel and to, and to surround yourself as best you can with people who are willing to hear you uh, emote and express. You know, there's a beautiful tradition um, in, in indigenous cultures have these, you know, kind of grief, um, these, these little memorials, these grief areas in their villages where you can go and grieve. There's a little, you know, they just have them naturally. Some village, sometimes they're outside the village, sometimes they're in the village. And I heard about this in, uh, from, uh, African shaman. And it was really important to these indigenous cultures to have places where people can emote and, and grieve healthily, either by themselves or with community. And here's the thing that's very important. I think in the modern culture, we've made a mistake around grief. We've, when people are grieving, they will say that they don't feel um, welcome or they feel like their grief is too much for their community, uh, for their friends. And so they feel marginalized or like they can't bring their full self into uh, their relationships. I, I think this is a problem. I think we need to, um, and I say this to, this is why I started with the first line. I said here, what, what do we need to do? What do, what can I say to people who are grieving? Find good people who can tolerate your grief and ask them to be with 
ask them to be with them on this journey. Say to them specifically, I, I, you know, I've lost so-and-so. This is really overwhelming for me. And I'm just wondering if I can count on you to share my experience, to emote, to spend some time with you, to have tea. Can you be a part of my grieving team? And, and this is really important because what happens is when you do this, you really solve a Western problem. I say Western, being the modern mm -hmm. you know, world we live in um, with grief. And that is, conversely, a lot of people want to help, but they don't know how. A or, lot of people- Or don't know what to have, say. I mean, what, yeah. Yeah, they don't know what to say. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I don't know. What are you meant to say sometimes? I don't know. Yeah. So, so this is why, this is why I tell the, the people that are the, the, the bereaved, get clear on what you need, or at least in that moment or a range of things and call up some people and say, listen, I, I know you reached out to me or I haven't heard from you. It's perfectly fine. Um, but I was wondering if you could be on my team and do this, this, and this. Some people just want to go for walks. Some people want to have deep conversation. Some people want to look at photos together. You know, everyone's got different, different roles. But the point I'm saying is don't isolate unless you really feel like that's what you need to do. Some people do. There's some introverted people that really need to isolate. But by and large, um, you know, when you're grieving, find out what you need and ask for that help. There's a lot of professional help. I, I work with a lot of people um, professionally, individually, and I do so over grief periods that can be, you know, a few months and often a few years. And I still tell everyone I'm working with, bring, don't isolate. If you, if you can talk to your good friends, talk to your family, see if they will talk to you um, or meet with you or do what you want, get clear on what it is and try to keep your routine as much you can. Even if you don't want to be there, sometimes it's just good to keep a routine. Uh, but like I said, grief and bereavement is not easy. It's not. It's not for the faint of hearts. But it does come to an end. And emoting and expressing are the best ways to kind of not. I don't want to. I don't like the term hasten your grief. It's the best way to grieve fully and to reconcile your grief. You will never, when I hear people say, I want to go back to the way I was, that is not an option. So I take that one off the table right away. If we're going to grieve healthily, we need to process the loss and come out, allow the loss to um, transform us, allow the grief to touch us and evolve us. We don't need to know where we're going, but we do need to know that uh, we're not going to go back to the person we were. You may go back to the same patterns, the same relationships, hopefully will be there, but you will be different. And that is a good thing that you've evolved. That's what we want in life is growth. Uh, it's painful, but we'll, we're thankful for it. And there will be new, new relationships to meet us on the other side. So I, I caution, and I do have to say caution, uh, my grief and bereaved uh, clients about making any big decisions during this time, because it takes time. It's a slow process. And in a society where we want quick fixes, grief stands at odds with that. So it takes some, um, it can be a difficult process because it's different than mm -hmm. most things that we want in the West. Well, thank you for sharing that. It just reminded me, someone said to me, never make big decisions when you're grieving. <laughs> um, yes, well said. <laughs> Um, you know, you, m some people have had these incredible shared death experiences, people that are grieving might not be psychic, but they're probably asking, how can I get signs? This is not typically your research, but how can I get messages from my loved ones that have transitioned? Um, actually, that is our research because okay, while the shared death, while the shared death experience is at this time, the primary focus largely because it's been um, left for a lot of reasons, unresearched, uh, unexamined. But, you know, I actually created a spectrum of end of life experiences because as a grief and bereavement therapist, I was hearing over and over again, 
of synchronicities. I, you know, uh, someone bereaved, I, you know, I feel like this bird, this, um, every time I walk outside, I see pennies in, in front of my car. I don't understand it. Now I am a very, uh, skeptical person, quite frankly, you wouldn't get that. You wouldn't think that by what I just said, because these could be these kind of, you know, willy nilly, wishful thinking, you know, woo wee type woo -woo. <laughs> thing. Woo woo. Yeah. yeah. But I will tell you, uh, there is data that, that is now, uh, available that suggests that these synchronistic events fall way above the, um, the data we have on, on chance or coincidence. There is something going on here quite profound. And, and, I, and we do collect these uh, post, you know, pre and post death synchronicities because they are not only are they meaningful for the bereaved, uh, they seem to be suggesting communication from the other side and we and we want to um, support that so there are other experiences too Luisa that I want to bring up uh, on our spectrum that are very important and I'll kind of go through it quickly there are there, when before someone dies there's often a pre-death premonition either by the dying or someone close to the dying we chart those there are pre and there are pre-death visions and visitations. They're often called dreams, but I don't like the term dreams because these are different than dreams. And if you ask them, they will tell you that this was not a dream. This was more real than real. I had a vision or I was visited. And, and these can be, these are typically the, the dying expressing that they, feel, that they were visited by a deceased loved one or elevated being. And oftentimes the caregivers or loved ones are there observing this conversation that the dying is having with somebody else. And they'll ask later, Hey, you know, I'm just wondering, you seem to be talking. And if they can remember, because these are state specific experiences, they may say, Oh, my, my, my mom came or my grandmother came and she was telling me everything's going to be okay. And yeah. to get ready, I'm going to be leaving soon. And da, da, da. So there are those experiences also an experience called terminal lucidity, which is, you know, kind of the rally is what they also called a, a, for those of us who work in hospice. Right before death, there's this increase in uh, physiological uh, capability, whether it's remembering things or being able to sit up and eat or have conversations when they were unresponsive. That type of uh, experience is also uh, profound. There's also the sh shared death experience we've talked about. And then afterwards, we have this direct post-death communication, which is it's as if uh, the bereaved or the surviving loved one will say that, I'm going through my life and I'm thinking certain things. And it's a, it's like my departed loved one is in my mind responding to these yeah. questions. I have things like I need to do the funeral arrangements. And I'm thinking about this, that, and the other thing. And all of a sudden the departed comes in and says, I want you to do this for my funeral. I want these people sitting here. I want this to be said at my eulogy and don't let him come and all the rest of it. So there's that. And then we have post, death, visions, and visitations, which are the most common. And these are the departed coming back, visiting the bereaved to say, essentially, hey, I'm okay. I'm alive and well here. I love you. And I'll see you again. These are all what we track. So if your listeners have these experiences, I'd encourage them to reach out to us uh, because we chart these and we are uh, doing a lot of uh, academic work on this, quite frankly, to substantiate these experiences. I already mentioned synchronicities. They happen throughout. Uh, you know, I live in, in Santa Barbara on the coast, and oftentimes I will uh, tell one of my clients, I'll say, you know, They'll say, I just want a sign that he's okay. And I'll say, okay, you walk on the beach, don't you? They go, yeah, every day I walk on the beach at you know, sunset. I go, okay, I want you to walk on that beach. But before you walk on that beach today, I want you to get into, I want you to do a practice that looks like this. Set an intention to ask your departed loved one to send you a sign while you're on your beach walk. And they say, okay, fine. I, I can't tell you how many times that client will come back a week later and say, 
all right, you're going to think I'm crazy, but <laughs> I did just what you said. I walked on the beach and all of a sudden I saw the biggest display of dolphins and a whale breach that I've ever seen in the entire 30 years I've walked on that beach. And I said, well, is that a sign? And they go, well, I think I'm, it sounds kind of crazy, but I, I think it is. So, um, so these types of things happen. And, and the only way that we can, you know, validate them is that the, because science isn't going to help us here. I've already said that it, it, you know, when you, when we take these experiences, it falls well beyond chance, uh, but still it's hard to draw any direct causal relationship here. But what is really important is it's meaningful for the bereaved and it suggests a continuing bond with the deceased. And that is very healthy and it helps grief. Uh, and so as a therapist, I can say in, you know, with my, you know, decades of doing this, I hear this all the time. Our research suggests these experiences happen and that they're real. And I want you to, you know, relate to this as if it is uh, your loved one reaching out to you and expressing that they are hearing you. And then, then it's the client's responsibility uh, and I encourage them to craft a new relationship with the deceased, which allows them to maintain this relationship and go on in their life in their own way. There's a whole body of therapy on this. It's a grief and bereavement therapy. It's called continuing bonds. And it's a beautiful therapy. It allows us to um, allow our loved ones to leave our lives in a certain way. They can, they can die, but it doesn't mean the relationship ends. It means quite the opposite. It means now we have the opportunity to recraft this relationship in a way that's meaningful for the bereaved and bring that relationship into the other uh, new aspects of their life. Beautiful, thank you. I wanna get onto your book in a minute at Heaven's Door, but I've got one more question. But first, where's the best place for people to contact you, William? Thank you. So. Um, Come to our website, sharedcrossing.com, and we have an info. Uh, just you can see, you can just you'll see our contacts there. You can just send things, and then we and we have a you know a small staff here, and we try the best we can to respond to people's questions. One thing I will say now that we're onto the website is uh, we created a story library. It's the first of its kind. It's video narratives of people sharing their, expressing their shared death experiences. And we're going to be updating that on a regular basis. It just launched a couple of weeks ago. We're quite proud of it because it took a lot of work to get it done. And these shared death experiencers from all walks of life or different parts of the world share their experiences. I think we have about a half dozen up right now. Uh, and we're gonna continue to rotate it to help people, but it's a good way for people to hear about these experiences uh, from the people who have them. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so there's that. That's how you amazing. Can, and yeah. I, I and if you missed that, I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone that's listening or Please. watching. Yeah. Um, I guess my last question for you before we go into the book and um, what are the what are the common regrets over the dying that they didn't do in this lifetime? I guess my question is, how can we live our best life? What do people wish they'd done? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's actually a good segue to the the book because it you know the shared the book is about you know, how, what, what does the shared death experience mm -hmm. teach us about living, you know, dying well and living better? I love it. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. And, and so living better, let's focus on that. You know, people, now I'm taking a step back. One thing we also do at the Shared Crossing Project, we have a series of programs that prepare people for what we call a conscious, connected, and loving end of life experience. And if you listen to the various things I've already mentioned about, you know, our fear of death, you ask a question, what causes the fear of death? Well, all of what we teach is how to come into relationship with death and with our loved ones and prepare for the best death possible. So we have uh, training programs, which we used to do in person, but we're bringing them online in 2022. So that's something as a resource for people. Um, but the core constituent, uh, core component of that program, we have a number of programs, but one of these programs called the Pathways is that we get people in relationship uh, to the fact that they're going to die. And what is the psycho emotional unfinished business of their life? 
We bring people through a review of their life and we really invite them to see what needs healing. That can be relationships, old and new. It can be business dealings. It can be, it can be just, you know, the way we've lived out of integrity with ourselves. And sometimes, you know, there are different ways to heal here. There's sometimes, you know, inviting people to call up uh, relations where and have a express forgiveness and uh, express regret and request forgiveness, something like that. Sometimes it's, you can't do that. You're not in relationship with anymore. And so we have practices for that, but it's really looking at regret. That's where it all lands. How do you look at your life with regret? A lot of people will say when they start our workshops, uh, you know, I've kind of worked through most of this stuff and I don't really have that many regrets. Well, we have a whole way of engaging people uh, quite directly that surfaces regret. I do these practices, you know, regularly with myself because I find that I think I've worked through something and life is a holograph. You get to a certain age, you, know, you move through your different evolution, if you will, in this lifetime. And I look back at things that I thought I healed and I realize, oh my God, from this vantage point, there's something else there that needs to be addressed. Yeah. So we take through these processes, but regret, you know, really it's unfinished business. And this is really helps at dying of a train coming by. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a okay. bit of entertainment. Uh, there's always time to um, review our lives. Well, I say there's not always time, but there is time if you are looking to have a good end of life experience, do a review of your life and look at your regrets and see what needs attention. And, and do, you know, good therapists can help you with this. A good friend can help with this. And some people can do it on their own. Uh, and a lot of the regret comes up quite naturally. If you look over your life, just go through it. You know, oh, geez, that's still there. Oh, I hadn't thought about that in a while. Um, but the real impetus for doing this is because as we get closer to death, should we have a slower death, which is the most common death in the modern world, your psychic structures, your ego structures that naturally defend us against um, negative experiences in our lives, they get weaker. And so these regrets get stronger. We can't push them away as easily. And because of that, they start tormenting us. And when you see people writhing uh, in a type of pain that we call emotional or spiritual pain, there isn't a, there isn't a medication that treats that. That's a psycho-spiritual pain that needs to be worked out with psycho-spiritual interventions. And I, that's why I encourage people, and our programs go into this, to really uh, unearth and process our regrets long before you're in an end of life situation. Mm -hmm. So no regrets. How do we live our best life right now? Even though who knows when death is at, at, at the door, but how do we live our best life? Yeah. You know, I think, I think that's the role of um, living a com contemplative, reflective, mindful life. You know, everybody has their own calling here. I, I'm, in that camp maybe it's just the way i'm wired if you will but i really believe that i and people i know closely have come to this incarnation with a particular calling a, a purpose or mission that doesn't mean it has to be some grandiose anything it, you know it, it it's just whatever it is maybe it's to be kind maybe it's to be a good uh brother parent aunt um, son, what, you know, whatever it's to, do, it's to help the environment. Maybe, you know, there are, it's it, it, the first step is for all of us to find out, to ask that big question. Why am I here? What am I called to do in this life? I think that is a question that is sadly lost in the modern world. And it, it's, it's, it, to me, it's the set. It's so sad because we are fixated on entertaining ourselves and missing the point for why we're here. Uh, we're looking for joy and fun, and, and that's fine. But most of us, you know, I can't say most of us, but I think a lot of us 
certainly your listeners can relate to, I'm here for a purpose. And, and our deepest um, manifestation of our truest self uh, is our work to find and, and, to, and, to re, and to live into that. That is what I often hear when I'm with someone dying. I wish I had done this. I should have done more for that. And it's sad at the end of life to see that people have not used this incarnation um, to its fullest availability. Thank you for sharing that beautiful message. I mean, gosh, the work you're doing is incredible. I'd love to move on to your book at Heaven's Door. Do you mind just sharing a little bit about it with the audience? Boy, thank you for asking. I appreciate that, Louisa. Yeah, this has been, you know, talking about mission and calling and all the rest of it. This has been, you know, my work for actually many decades. Uh, and this book came about because the research um, on the shared death experience is so uh, inspiring about what death can be. Uh, the goal is to normalize these shared death experiences, these incredible spiritual experiences that happen at the end of life that are, can be um, dismissed, sometimes discounted, and in some settings disparaged. Uh, so I wrote this because I wanted everybody to know who's willing to read it that these experiences happen, they're normal, and they are gifts. And that when we get, when we, if we are fortunate to have a shared death experience, there are so, so many gifts within it, so much uh, beauty, so much love, so much understanding about the purpose of a human life and what lies beyond, that we need to embrace this as a human birthright, quite frankly. Uh, and, and right now, um, these experiences are not being properly understood or honored. And so that's my hope for the book is that people, and this is also for healthcare practitioners. Um, I sent this book out to a lot of my colleagues who work directly in end of life. And their response to me is, oh my God, William, all I can say is thank you because I can take this to our medical director and say to them, here's the research, here's the stories. We're going to, I am going to integrate this into our end of life protocols with families and the dying. And because right now we don't know how to, we don't know what to do with these experiences. And so they, they don't get the attention they need. Now with this resource, um, we can say, here it is. And I should say, we also have uh, research in the American Journal of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, as well as an article coming out in Omega. Uh, the Journal for Death and Dying Studies. So we are well documented in the major medical uh, and academic journals around death and dying. So this is the transformation I'm, I'm seeking is that people can um, have the shared death experience, they can prepare for it, they can have it, and they can really harvest the gifts from it. And that makes our relationship with death and dying and to all our departed loved ones so much more meaningful and so much more filled with a sense of belonging and a sense of continued relationship uh, through death and beyond. I love, I just love the work you're doing. And I just wanted to also say um, the book is not only for, uh, yes, it's about shared death experience, but anyone that's close to death or had a loved one that died can translate into death in general and grieving because I also see death as a gift in some way. So it, it just it reaches, can reach so many people. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that because I, um, I may have misrepresented it uh, by saying for healthcare practitioners, because it's not, it's made for the general public. I mean, and, and the, our publisher, Simon & Schuster, uh, has put this in you know, one of their lead books for 2022 for the general public. They see this as a... Um, a book of great, if not essential public uh, interest. And they, they look at this as a book for the ages, quite frankly, they, you know, and, I, and I'm grateful for them to take this on. Uh, and I hope they're right, because I do think this is a book that will be with us for some time uh, and hopefully get into the canon of the great books. Uh, I, I hope like so too. <laughs> Um, William, yeah. gosh, it's been such a delight to talk to you. I've asked most of the questions. Is there anything else on a final note you'd like to share with the Passion Harvest audience? 
Well, I just, just want to say thank you for listening and that death is the great frontier that is largely unexplored in our modern culture. And I just invite them, uh, everyone, to, to get to know death better and to talk about it with, fr- with friends and family and bring it into your living room. Bring it into your dining room and make it a topic of conversation and explore together. And I, this resource I've offered with At Heaven's Door is just one. But I think you'll find if you start sharing stories with your friends and family about death, you'll find that there's there's a lot of amazing, uh, heartwarming and mind uh, expanding experiences that you might not have known that your, some of your closest relations have had and you as well. So uh, let's do this together. Let's, let's really make death and dying uh, more of a, a part of our life in a good way. Amazing. What a beautiful way to end the show, William Peters. Thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. It's just been so insightful and delightful and inspiring. And and the work you're doing is amazing. Thank you, Louisa, for having me. It's a pleasure to have been here and spent this hour with you. Thanks so much. Bye, William. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate, inspirational interviews.